Well, good evening. We are so glad that you've taken time out of your busy schedule to join us tonight as we continue with our study on the end times. It's an exciting study, and the thing that I cannot emphasize to you enough is that I believe John gave us the recording of what was revealed to him on the Isle of Patmos as a warning and as an urgent message to all of us that this is something that we want to avoid at all costs. As we look around and we see what's taking place in the world around us, if ever there was a time for the church to be the watchman on the wall, if ever there was a time to get the good news of the gospel out, friend, it's in this day and hour in which we live. So I encourage you, be in prayer for your lost family members, for your lost friends, for your neighbors, and pray that God will give you wisdom and insight as to how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them so that they will be ready when the Lord returns for us by way of the rapture. Well, tonight we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 18, and chapter 18 of the book of Revelation describes to us the destruction of a literal Babylon, which in chapter 18 it is described as the political capital of the Antichrist. Let's go ahead and pick up with verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render her to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judges her. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. Standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city of Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster who traveled by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance, and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like? This great city. They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down, and shall not be found any more. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you any more. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you any more, 
and the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. May the Lord bless our time together as we study from his word. Here in Revelation chapter 18, we read about the literal destruction of the city of Babylon, which is the political capital of the Antichrist during this time. This Babylon is different from the one that we discussed last week in chapter 17. If you remember, chapter 17 concerned religious Babylon, but here in chapter 18 it pictures a political or a commercial Babylon. Religious Babylon was called Mystery Babylon because commercial Babylon is referred to as Babylon the Great. And religious Babylon was presented as a woman or a mother, while commercial Babylon is portrayed as a city. And not only a city, but a great city, a mighty city, and eventually, as the chapter continues to unfold, a burning city. Religious Babylon was destroyed by the kings of the earth. We read about in verse 16 of Revelation 17. But political Babylon will be destroyed by horrendous judgments from none other than the hand of God himself. When religious Babylon was destroyed, the kings of the earth rejoiced. But here, when political Babylon is demolished, the kings and the merchants of the earth lament and weep for her in verses 9 and 15 of the text that we just read. Now, it would seem that the city of Babylon will be rebuilt in Iraq sometime in the near future. This is one of the unmistakable signs of the last days. And it only makes sense that the city has to be rebuilt before it can be destroyed. We know that the ancient city of Babylon had been destroyed and rebuilt many times throughout the course of history. We also know that there was a city called Babylon in New Testament times because Peter refers to the church that is in Babylon in 1 Peter chapter 5, 13. This city has probably either changed name or been abandoned since Peter's day. At any rate, the kind of sudden and total destruction upon a thriving city predicted in Revelation 18 has not yet been fulfilled, and we know that it is a future event. Because of its strategic position on the Euphrates River, irrigation of the fertile soil will make it possible for the valley to support many more people than it does now. This is in the ancient land of Shinar, known today as Iraq. It was the Syrian division of the ancient Grecian Empire. And since both agriculture and the oil industry have bright futures in this country, it is not hard to see how a bustling and commercial center such as Babylon described here in this chapter could grow up quickly, even after the rapture. The strategic oil resources in that part of the world may serve as the immediate reason for the final rays of the ancient city before its awful judgment takes place. John begins this chapter by saying here in verse 1, after these things. Well, what's he talking about? After what things? Well, after the, after the fulfillment of the destruction of religious Babylon, John's statement is further proof that the two Babylons are entirely different and distinctive of one another. Only after the events of chapter 17 does John see God's judgment upon political Babylon in the verses that follow. The angel bringing the warning of impending judgment is powerful and glorious. His appearing, notice, lightens the entire globe with his glory. And many Bible scholars believe that it is none other than Jesus Christ himself, who Jesus describes himself as the light of the world in John 8, 12. In verse 2, God's judgment of commercial Babylon has begun. The angel's cry is this, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Why? Because it continues by telling us she has become the dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. This is in reference to the city of Babylon being loaded with lust-ridden sinners. Whatever pleasures of the flesh, whatever pleasures that man can conceive in his heart are found contained in the four walls of the city. Political Babylon is described here as a cage containing every unclean and hated bird, 
controlled by foul spirits and demons who inhabit the land and its people. Verse 3 reveals that just like religious Babylon, this political system has turned to idolatry and to fornication. As we saw in chapter 17, these terms refer to the worship of strange gods and the love of this world's material goods. Seeking prestige and power, commercial or political, political Babylon has promoted and joined ungodly world alliances. The text continues by stating that the nations of the earth have partaken of the wine of her wrath, of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed spiritual fornication with her for personal gain. And as a result, the merchants of the earth have become exceedingly wealthy by wheeling and dealing with this nation who is abundantly loaded with worldly delicacies. Verses 4 and 5 issue a warning to the believers of the tribulation hour to come out from among them so that they would not be partakers of her sins and not be subject to the plagues that God is about to pour out upon her. Notice this coincides with what Jesus said. You are in the world, but you are not of this world. And friend, I would encourage you that even in this day and hour in which we live, that we do not become encumbered by the cares of the world, that we are not in pursuit of temporal pleasures and of, of temporal means of gains here because they, they are only temporal. And it's important to us to understand that we have one priority, and that is preparing for eternity, that we are doing our best to reach the world with the gospel message, and that we recognize that we are but pilgrims passing through this world. This earth is not our home, but praise God, heaven will be for all eternity as we serve the Lord. This warning that is given to these saints that are part of the tribulation hour is referring to those who trusted in the shed blood of the Lamb and refused to receive the mark of the beast. They are to live holy lives in the midst of such debauchery and sin and refrain from illegal gain through the love of the delicacies of this world. Continuing on in verses 6 and 7, we see God's law of sowing and reaping coming into full effect. Friend, here's the truth of the matter. Humanity cannot get away with sin forever. What does it tell us in Galatians? It tells us that, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that will we also reap. And we see that being fulfilled here in chapter 18 of Revelation. Recognize God hates sin. It is inconsistent with his holiness. And except for God's mercy, most of us would have been dead already and in hell long ago. His grace, however, passes all human understanding. And thank God for his grace and for his mercy and for his forgiveness. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Still, God cannot tolerate sin forever, and the reaping of political Babylon's iniquity must finally take place. What a terrible experience as Babylon experiences a double portion of God's judgment. God tells us here in verse 6, double the judgment upon Babylon according to her works. And this was the punishment under the law of Moses that you can read about there in Exodus chapter 22, verse 4, and again in verse 7. The inhabitants of Babylon have lived extravagantly. Her wealthy became wealthier and her poor became poorer. As a nation, she had no compassion or concern about the poor, for she said, I am a queen. I see no sorrow. I do not want to look at the needs of the impoverished. Their judgment takes place as Babylon is burned. In verses 8 through 19, it tells of her destruction, and I want to read them again in your hearing. Follow along with me. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her, for they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, 
fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. When the news of Babylon's destruction is received, earth's kings, earth's monarchs, potentates, and presidents immediately begin to weep because the source of their wealth has literally disintegrated in an hour's time. They are joined by the members of the world's Chamber of Commerce. And let's take a moment and view the commodities that are listed here in verses 8 through 19. Notice that not one of them is really a necessity. In fact, the entire display may be classified as luxurious, worldly babbles used to impress high society. The merchandise of gold and of silver, of precious stones and pearls that are used for investment portfolios, fine linen, purple and silk and scarlet for fashionable dress, every kind of citron wood and all manner vessels of ivory and manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and of iron and marble that are used to make high-class furniture, all kinds of spices and ointments for sensuousness, stockpiles of wine, of oil, of fine flour and wheat, beasts and sheep and horses for the satisfying of the flesh, and chariots for the getaway, and slaves for labor to increase wealth, and finally the souls of men for lust and other demeaning practices. Friends, when you read this and you see what's taking place there, judgment must come, and rest assured, it will come. It's important to take note that the treasures of the tribulation enterprises do not last, and neither will the temporal pleasures of this world last. Verse 14 tells us the fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you and you shall find them no more at all. Verse 10 and verse 17 tell us that they will be destroyed in one hour. No further comment is needed at this point for the preceding texts are self-explanatory. Again, verses 15 through 19, the merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. You know, as the world weeps over the destruction of political Babylon, it's interesting to note that all of heaven breaks forth in praise in verse 20. To this point, Throughout our study, there has only been one other command to rejoice recorded in the book of Revelation. Everything besides that has been solemn and sad. And at the overthrow of Babylon, however, the cherubim and the seraphim and other angelic orders are told to praise the Lord. The holy apostles and the prophets, representatives of Old and New Testament saints, are instructed to join them as well. Why, you might ask? Because the chief enemy of the people 
has been destroyed. Speaking of the Antichrist, the world persecuted the prophets. They persecuted the apostles and the saints of God during every age. Hebrews 11, verses 35 through 38, records the sufferings that were inflicted upon them. Picking up with Hebrews eleven thirty five, 35, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and in caves of the earth. Now such oppression is ended forever. I would encourage you, if you have not already done so, read Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's available in most Christian bookstores or from Amazon, but it details the martyrdom of Christians throughout the history of time. Friends, we do not know how blessed we are to live in this great land of America. Oh yes, there is verbal persecution. And yes, as we look around, we see the all-out attack against Christianity and Judeo-Christian morals and beliefs are under attack like never before. But when you compare it to what others who have gone before us, and even now in different parts of the world, the way that they are being persecuted because of their love for Jesus Christ, we have nothing at all to be moaning about. Oh, if ever there was a time that as a Christian we need to take a stand, if ever there was a time that we need to sound a battle cry against sin and pray that God will grip the hearts of America and turn our heart back to God once again, it's this day and hour in which we live. As we said, this oppression is ended forever because Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Praise the Lord in despite of all of the adversity that's taking place and all of the things that are happening around the world, aren't you glad that you can rest assured in the fact that God is still seated on the throne? That there is nothing that takes him by surprise. This is all unfolding as God knew that it would in his omniscience, and God indeed will have the final word. The world can no longer touch God's people. For God has avenged you on her, is what we read here. Or from the original Greek text, which is stronger, it says, God has placed your judgment on her. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And friend, we need to remember that. God is not just idly standing by. He is recording every atrocity that has come against followers of Jesus Christ. And vengeance will be poured out upon them for those who do not repent and turn their lives over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21 speaks of an angel taking up a stone like a large millstone and casting it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any longer. Most Bible scholars identify this stone as none other than Jesus Christ himself. In Acts chapter 4, verse 11, it tells us that Christ is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. The stone strikes at the end time when the ten toes or ten western nations are aligned. You remember the vision that Daniel had in Daniel chapter 2, and he talks about this in verses 34 as well as in verses 44 and 45, where a stone that was not hewn by the hands of man comes rolling down and strikes this huge image that Nebuchadnezzar has in his dream and strikes the toes and the feet of this image and it comes crashing down and is ground to fine powder. So thorough is the stone's destruction that Babylon is finished forever. Verse 22 continues by recording that all entertainment also comes to a halt in this laugh a minute commercial empire. All music is silenced. All craftsmen are put out of business. All production is halted in commercial Babylon as the international center of commerce is destroyed by none other than God Almighty himself. In verse 23, we read where lights are extinguished, probably through energy deficiencies. Marriage ceases and heartbreak inundates the land. No longer is there time for joy, for love, and for romance. And the closing verses of this chapter reveal three reasons for God's judgment of Babylon. Listen carefully. First of all, her love of wealth and riches. Her merchants were the great men 
of the earth. Do not allow yourself to be sucked in by the luxuries of this world. Do not have a love for them more than your love for God. Second, her abusive usage of drugs. Notice it says, for by her sorceries were all nations deceived. And the word sorceries in this text, again, comes from the Greek word pharmakia, translated pharmacy in English. This term refers to getting high on or getting kicks out of drugs. And we know of the drug epidemic that has swept across the land of America. And at the last reason for God's judgment is Babylon's hatred, her abuse, and persecution of the people of God. It tells us here, for in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Babylon will never have human inhabitants again after this outpouring of God's judgment upon her. Instead, it will become the habitation of devils, of foul spirits, and unclean and hateful birds, which are representative of every debaucherous sin, heinous crime that you can possibly imagine. Next week, we'll be continuing our study and looking at Revelation 19 and the Battle of Armageddon. And I hope that you will join us as we continue with our study of end times. But most importantly, that you will understand the importance of being ready for the Lord's return. Friend, I cannot emphasize to you enough the importance of knowing that it is well with your soul, that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, and that you know that should he return within the next moment, that heaven would be your eternal home. If you do not have that assurance, I implore you, I encourage you to take this very moment, even now, and pray the following prayer along with me. Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner, but Lord, I ask today that you would come into my life as my Lord. I ask you for forgiveness of my sins. God, I'm sorry for the things that I have committed against you and your word. Lord God, I pray that in your faithfulness and in your tender mercy and grace that you would wipe away my every sin with your precious blood. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior, and I confess readily that you are the Christ, the only begotten Son of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Thank you for hearing my prayer. And Lord, give me the strength, give me the ability with the help of your Holy Spirit to remain faithful in service to you. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And friend, as you prayed that prayer, God has heard that and he has erased your sins from your life for now and for all eternity. I encourage you to get into the word of God. The gospel of John is a great place to begin. It's the fourth book of the New Testament. It explains the plan of salvation. It explains what it is to live a Christian life about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is another wonderful gift that God the Father has promised to each and every one of us and preparing for eternity, looking forward to the day of Christ's return. Get into a good church that preaches the gospel. We would love to have you join us here at HFA on Sundays at 10 o'clock. If you don't have a church that you attend on a regular basis, we invite you to go to our website, hfachurch.org. On there, you'll find a link, Save Me a Seat on Sunday. Go ahead and Put your name in there, also the number of people attending with you, and we will look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday. We want to thank you also for your faithfulness and your giving. And remember, if during this time we can serve you in any way, please feel free to call the church office at 540-433-8687. Know that we love you. Know that we are praying for you. And again, we look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday. May God bless you, and may you have a great remainder of the week.